Hi, everybody. I want to thank Dr. Masaki and the organizers for this event for having me here today. It's been a pleasure. Again, like Dr. Masaki said, I'm Ryan Nakasone. I'm a local medical oncologist here in Honolulu, working at Hawaii Oncology, which is a private practice group. Today, I have the privilege of speaking to you about colon cancer, which is a very important topic because it is one of the potentially preventable diseases. So I definitely want to get that point across. So let's get started. So colon cancer, whenever we talk about cancer, there's a lot of questions that we often get is, how common is this disease? And so colon cancer is one of the more common types of cancer. It's approximately 145,000 new cases diagnosed annually in the United States. When we talk about this entity, it's often grouped with rectal cancer. So oftentimes it's called colorectal cancer. There's about 100,000 new colon cancer cases and about 44,000 new rectal cancer cases. The gist of this talk is going to be more focused on colon cancer, so we're not really going to focus too much on rectal cancer. About 51,000 people are expected to die of, uh, of colon cancer annually. The mortality has been decreasing since 1990, but it's still the third most common cause of cancer death in the United States. This table is a good one because it shows you it's a little bit dated, it's a few years old, but the trends are the same. This breaks down, the top is estimated new cases of cancer, the bottom is estimated deaths, and it's broken up by males and females. As you can see in males, the three most common cancers are prostate cancer, lung cancer, and colorectal cancer. And the estimated deaths is the lung cancer is the highest, prostate cancer is second, and then colorectal cancer is third. In females, it's a little bit different. Breast cancer is the most common cancer, followed by lung cancer, and then colorectal cancer. And in terms of deaths, you have lung cancer at the top, breast cancer second, and then colorectal cancer third. So as you can see, it's one of the more common cancers, as, one, as well as one of the more common causes of cancer-related death. So who gets colon cancer? So as you can see by this table, men and women both get it. Men tend to get it more frequently than women. And if you look on the right side, this is the men and women combined, but looking at it by race and ethnicity. So the most common is non-Hispanic black people who often get it more. And then on the far right, you can see Asian Pacific Islanders are not immune to colon cancer, but they tend to get it less, statistically speaking. Interestingly, the incidence of colorectal cancer in men and women under the age of 50 has been actually increasing, and we don't have a really good reason why. Greater than 85% of those diagnosed under the age of 50 are often associated with a more advanced stage and a more aggressive type of cancer at the time of diagnosis, and they have poor outcomes because of this. Even because of this fact, or even with this fact, the screening guidelines for colon cancer hasn't really been changed yet. And it's not routinely recommended yet for people under the age of 50 unless they have a condition that increases the risk of having colon cancer. Certain conditions like uh, inflammatory bowel disease, history of abdominal radiation, a family history of colon cancer, or a genetic syndrome or a pre-existing um, inherited syndrome that can increase risk of colon cancer. The looking, this is just some verbiage regarding the table we just looked at. The highest incidence rates of um, colon cancer are in Australia, New Zealand, Europe, and North America. The lowest rates are actually in Africa and South Central Asia. We think the differences are linked to dietary and environmental exposures, as well as some genetically determined susceptibility. There are some potentially modifiable risk factors as well. Physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, smoking, obesity, these are all things that can contribute to increase, increased risk of colon cancer, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Age is a major risk factor for sporadic colorectal cancer. It's uncommon under the age of 40, but then increases from 40 to 50 and increases further as we get older as well. So this is the table, uh, a graph looking at it. As you can see, again, Australia, New Zealand at the top. Uh, with the highest incidence, and then it's a cone graph going all the way down to the bottom with Western Africa having the lowest incidence. Lifetime incidence of colorectal cancer in average risk patients in the United States is approximately 5 to 8 percent. Again, higher in men than women and higher in African Americans than in Caucasians. When people get diagnosed with cancer, one of their first questions is, What's my, what's my chance of dying from this cancer? You know, what's my survival statistics? So looking at the mortality of colon cancer, we saw, and I alluded to it earlier, that death rates have been decreasing since the 1980s. We think part of this is because of the higher implementation of screening. So I'm sure all your doctors have been talking to you guys about uh, getting your colonoscopies, checking your stool, that sort of thing. So we believe we're catching cancers earlier. But in addition to that, our treatments for cancer have gotten a little bit better over the past 30 years. Um, the United States does have one of the highest survival rates from colorectal cancer compared to the rest of the world. 
according to this big database that we have in our in oncology, the five-year overall survival rates for all stages, one through four of colon cancer, uh, who undergo treatment is approximately 61%. So what are some risk factors? And I alluded to some of them earlier. If we look at it, older age is a risk factor, personal or family history of colorectal cancer or polyps, inflammatory bowel disease, so this is something like uh, Crohn's disease, for example, or ulcerative colitis, which I'll briefly talk about in a little bit. Lynch syndrome or other inherited syndromes that increase your risk of colon cancer. And then diabetes is actually a known risk factor for colon cancer. The hereditary colorectal cancer syndrome. So this is genetics that you're born with that can increase your risk of other types of cancer as well. But again, we're focusing more on the colorectal cancer world. So there's the one called familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP, and another one called Lynch syndrome, which is the hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. These are the most common of the familial syndromes, together accounting for approximately only 5% of colorectal cancer cases, with Lynch syndrome being more common than the familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP. Typical FAP, you see numerous colonic adenomas, or polyps, appearing even as early as childhood. Cancer occurs in 90% of these people if they're untreated by the age of 45. And this is just a picture of a colon, uh, uh, artistic rendering of a colon with multiple, multiple polyps or adenomas in it. So Lynch syndrome, or the hereditary non-polyposis, this accounts for approximately 3% of colonic adenocarcinomas. You suspect it if the family has a strong, if the family has a strong history of colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, or uterine cancer, um, and some other types of cancers as well. Mean age of diagnosis, approximately 48 years old. And again, endometrial carcinoma is common, ovarian cancer, stomach cancer, small bowel cancer, brain cancer, renal pelvis cancer, um, are just some of the cancers that you're at increased risk for if you have this uh, genetic syndrome. Inflammatory bowel disease, so not a genetic condition, but the, most, uh, the main type that I want to talk about is ulcerative colitis. So this is where you have inflammation of basically your entire large intestine. Uh, the extent of the, the ulcerative colitis, the duration, how long you've had it, and the activity of the disease, is it quiet right now or is it flaring? Those are some of the risk factors that lead to the increased risk of colon cancer. Pancolitis, so again, inflammation of the entire colon, leads to a 5 to 15 times increased risk compared to the general population. Crohn's disease, which is another type of inflammatory bowel disease, there's less data regarding Crohn's disease and the link to colon cancer. But again, you can see pancolitis in people with Crohn's disease. And again, you can have an increased risk of, your, of uh, developing cancer. But again, the data is less consistent compared to ulcerative colitis. Race is a factor. So like we talked about earlier, African-Americans have the highest colorectal cancer rates of all ethnic, ethnic groups in the United States. It occurs at a younger age, and there's a higher frequency under the age of 50 in African-Americans. Again, we're not 100% sure if these racial differences are biologic, just due to their genetic makeup, or due to lower rates of access to screening, for example, uh, among African-Americans in the United States. So more of a socioeconomic risk factor. However, the American College of Gastroenterology does recommend screening begin at the age of 45 in African Americans and not 50 like your typical average, uh, your typical person, um, and that colonoscopy is the preferred screening test because of the increased risk of colon cancer in this patient population. The United States uh, Preventive Service Task Force, or USPSTF, they do not recommend that screening be altered as a function of race or ethnicity, so they differ a little bit from the American College of Gastroenterology. However, just this past year in 2021, the American College of Gastroenterology issued a big update. So they do recommend colorectal cancer screening in average risk individuals between the ages of 50 and 75 to reduce the incidence of advanced adenoma, which is a aggressive polyp, uh, colorectal cancer, and then mortality from colorectal cancer. This is a strong recommendation. The moderate quality evidence is there. The update was really interesting, though. They now are suggesting colorectal cancer screening in average risk individuals between the ages of 45 to 49. Now, remember, we just talked about they recommended less than the age of 50 in African Americans, but this time they're recommending in all people, basically below 50 from 45 to 49, again, to reduce the incidence of advanced adenoma, colorectal cancer, or mortality. This is a conditional recommendation, and the evidence isn't high quality just yet, but the American College of Gastroenterology has made that move to recommend screening colonoscopies begin at a younger age. 
Obesity is a risk factor. There's multiple studies that show that weight gain between early adulthood and midlife was associated with a modest but increased risk of colorectal cancer. A lot of people talk about red and processed meats being a risk factor for cancers, including colorectal cancer. The data is not consistent, but long-term consumption of red meat or processed meats does appear to be associated with an increased risk of colorectal cancer. Studies have been attempted to look more into this, but the results have been mixed in both the positive and the negative light. So it's a little bit more controversial than we originally thought. Tobacco and alcohol, they're big risk factors for a multitude of issues, not just cancer, but you can see an increased risk of cancer. Cigarette smoking, we always think of cigarette smoking linked to lung cancer, for example, but there's actually an increased risk of cigarette smoking with colorectal cancer. The risk of developing was increased among cigarette smokers compared to those who have never smoked before. And the risk of dying from colorectal cancer, so the mortality rate, was also increased among smokers compared to non-smokers. It's also a risk factor for all types of colonic polyp formation. Alcohol, there is an association between alcohol consumption and, again, increased risk of colorectal cancer as well. Activity and diet. So diet, a little bit, we talked about the red meat just a few slides ago. There are many epidemiologic studies that have shown an association between a diet high in fruits and vegetables and actually colorectal cancer protection, so less of a risk of colorectal cancer. The mechanism for this, though, uh, we don't have a huge understanding of why this truly is, but again, we believe that it's linked to some of the free radical formation from barbecued foods, et cetera, et cetera. The data, however, is discordant between several studies. So again, the data is not super conclusive. But when you look at vegetarians versus non-vegetarians, for example, the vegetarian diet has also been associated with a significantly reduced risk of colorectal cancer, again, pointing to the fact that meats somehow play a role in the generation of colorectal or increasing your risk of colorectal cancer. Physical activity, like I alluded to earlier, obesity is a risk factor for colorectal cancer. And there are some studies that suggest regular physical activity, either occupational or leisure, does protect you from colorectal cancer. But again, the mechanism is not 100% known yet. So a lot of people ask, well, how do I know if I have colon cancer, right? Like, what are the signs, you know, what's, what's going to happen to me? What can I look out for? The signs and symptoms, however, can be nonspecific. In some people, you can see weight loss. You can see fatigue from if they develop iron deficiency anemia, if they're bleeding a little bit from the colon cancer. Over time, they become anemic or low red blood cells. But many people are having no symptoms, right? They don't even know they have a problem, and they get their colonoscopy, for example, and there's a mass that's found. Um, if it's significantly advanced, you can see intestinal obstruction, you can see inflammation of the lining of the abdomen or peritonitis, or significant GI bleeding. Abdominal pain, uh, change in bowel habits. So some of the questions we'll ask is, have you noticed your stool size is changing? The caliber of the stool is changing? The color of the stool is changing? Uh, nausea, vomiting can happen. Again, if that colon cancer is causing a blockage in the bowel, for example. They did a large retrospective study, so looking back over patients over time, and it was about 30,000 patients. And it showed that change in bowel habits, again, was one of the most common symptoms in about 74% of people. Rectal mass or abdominal mass in 25, about to 13% of people. The low red blood cell due to iron deficiency in about 10% of people. And the abdominal pain by itself was the least common symptom is about 4% of people. Sometimes you can see changes to the colon on imaging, like a CT scan, for example. And one of the classic ways it can look on imaging is something called an apple core lesion. And so this is three pictures of apple core lesion. So you can actually see... Um, this is normal colon coming down, and then this is actually, if you think of it in a 3D way, the colon cancer is going around the colon itself and kind of pinching into it, and that's why you have apple core. So this tiny little area is actually the normal lumen that's being surrounded and pushed down by the cancer itself. The middle picture, same thing. You have normal colon, normal colon, and then this little itty-bitty area, and again, the apple core being around it, the colon cancer surrounding it. And again, this last picture, same thing, normal colon, and then the apple core area with a tiny little area of normal colon where things are passing uh, as, again, the colon cancer surrounds it. Symptoms can differ depending on location of tumor. So we talk about right-sided tumor, left-sided tumor, and we won't really focus on that for this discussion, but there can definitely be, be depending on the size of the tumor and the location of the tumor in the colon, um, how it can manifest as different symptoms that we talked about. 
Metastases. So whenever we talk about any cancer, we talk about staging, and I'll talk about staging brief uh, in a little bit. But you, so in some patients, unfortunately, some of their first symptoms or manifestations of the colon cancer, unfortunately, is when the cancer is already spread. So these are called metastases. Approximately 20% of people with, um, have metastases at the time of diagnosis, so that's not a small number. It can be spread by the lymphatics, which is a fluid circulating system in the body, uh, or blood, or even direct extension of the cancer into another area. The most common sites are lymph nodes that surround the colon or in the area of the colon. The liver, the lungs, for example, are very common sites of colon cancer spread. And the signs and symptoms that the patient can manifest may be actually due to the metastases and not due to the colon cancer itself. So things like, um, uh, what's an example? Uh, shortness of breath, cough, coughing of blood, for example, could be manifestations of the colon cancer having already spread to the lungs and causing problems in the lungs. So the patient didn't even know that they had a colon issue, but they manifested the signs and symptoms when the cancer has already spread to another area. So diagnosis, right? So if you suspect you have something going on or if your doctor suspects something's going on, right, how do we diagnose colon cancer? We need to get the tissue. As a lot of people like to say, tissue is the issue when we need to know what we're dealing with. And so there's different techniques that gastroenterologists can use, flexible sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, but basically it boils down to ideally we need some kind of biopsy to give us the diagnosis firmly. And when we talk about, we're going to talk about uh, early stage colon cancer, where you just have the mass in the colon or the polyp in the colon, there's many different types of polyps, polyps that exist, but it truly is all about the polyp. Polyps can become cancerous over time, which is why colonoscopies are important, because the gastroenterologist looks in the colon, they can see the polyp, and they can remove the polyp in the hopes of preventing that polyp from becoming cancerous over time. This is just a picture kind of showing the progression of how a polyp can start and how it becomes cancerous. So if you look at the far left, for example, you have just hypoproliferation, which is excessive growth, excessive tissue growth, not cancerous. It can become an adenomatous polyp or a larger adenomatous polyp, so that's the second and third bumps, for example. Then you can have severe dysplasia. So dysplasia is abnormal tissue growth that some people think is like a precancerous lesion, right? So as you can see in this larger polyp here, you already have this abnormal tissue growing yeah, that can be considered precancerous. So ideally, again, if seen on colonoscopy, that can be removed before it becomes a bigger problem. This next guy is an adenocarcinoma. So an adenocarcinoma is a scientific term for basically colon cancer. So when you get to this point, you already have, oh, there was my other oh, go. You already have growth of this tissue to a point where it's become truly cancerous. And then if that cancer is invading into the uh, colon and starting to spread, that's what we call more of an invasive cancer. So again, you ideally want to catch the polyp at this stage or sooner, right, before it becomes, again, cancerous and a big problem. Like I mentioned, there's different types of polyps. So some of you may have already had colonoscopies and may have already heard some of these terms because you may have had these types of polyps. But tubular adenoma is the most common type of polyp. It's 45% of polyps seen in people. And it has a malignancy risk, so the chance of becoming cancerous is about 2%. So not zero, right? So you still want to watch these polyps to make sure you don't form new polyps. There's these other polyps called hyperplastic polyps. They're seen about 35% of people, but they have a malignancy risk of basically zero. Some people, yeah, basically zero. And so these guys, if they're removed, we don't really think too much of them in terms of their cancer risk. There's, there's this, uh, these polyps here called tubulovillus adenomas. They're seen in about 6% of polyps, but their malignant potential is actually higher. They're more abnormal. So there's a 20 to 25% chance of this thing becoming cancer, this type of polyp becoming cancerous. Another one called villus adenoma, not super common. It's only about 1% in terms of the incidence of uh, this type of polyp. But again, its malignant potential can range anywhere from 15 to 40%. So definitely, you want to jump on these polyps early. You want to get rid of them if possible so that you prevent the colon cancer formation. So a lot of people think, oh, man, I've been getting labs from my, PC, my primary doctor for years, and it's never shown me cancer. You know, why wasn't it caught on blood tests? And unfortunately, the fact of the matter being, blood tests aren't good at diagnosing cancers very often. Um, they're just not helpful because they don't really, we can't really look, we don't have the technology yet to really look for cancer in the blood. However, there's some new things out there called circulating tumor cells, which we're not going to talk about today. Um, but that might be the wave of the future in terms of trying to find and diagnose cancer, but different conversation. 
So for example, if you get blood from your primary and you do not have anemia, that doesn't mean you don't have colon cancer, right? So that's why blood tests are not super helpful. Checking your liver function, for example, when you get your cholesterol checked and from your primary, again, your liver function could be normal on your blood test, but you could have a big tumor in your liver, for example. So again, blood tests are not very helpful when it comes to diagnosing cancer. When we talk about differential diagnosis, it's basically a term that we used to say, well, what else could this be, right? Because sometimes the, the signs and the symptoms that we talked about regarding colon cancer are nonspecific, and there are other things that can cause very similar signs and symptoms. So for example, if you have a growth in the rectum, for example, it could just be a hemorrhoid, right? Or what they call diverticulitis, which is an inflamed diverticulum. It could be an infection. It could be that inflammatory bowel disease we talked about, like ulcerative colitis that's causing the pain and the bleeding, for example. So that's why you have to get checked out, if, especially if you're having these symptoms or problems, but because it doesn't have to be colon cancer, right, or rectal cancer. There are other types of cancers that it could be. Uh, carcinoid, for example, lymphoma, which is more of a blood type of cancer, can manifest as a mass. So people might think they have colon cancer, but upon biopsy, it's something else. So again, you know, there are other things that it could be, which is why we have to evaluate it. I talked about earlier a staging, right? And again, a staging is a system or a nomenclature that we use to try and figure out the extent of the cancer, where is the cancer located, but also it gives us a more of a sense of prognosis, right? Can I cure this cancer versus can this cancer not be cured? And are we just talking more about controlling it for as long as possible? Yeah. So again, this picture is, I thought, a nice picture. We have um, stage one cancer, let's say. It's an, it's an invasive adenocarcinoma, but it's that's early at stage. It's small. It hasn't spread, et cetera. And we talk about penetration through layers of the colon. So as you can see here, it's penetrating into some of the colon tissue, but it hasn't gone all the way through the colon, for example. Stage two, you can see it as a little bit bigger tumor. As you can see on this end of it, it's piercing more into the layers of the colon, uh, but it has not yet spread beyond that local area. Yeah? When we talk about stage three, as you can see, it's bigger. It's penetrating more into the colon. But as you can see here, the surrounding lymph nodes already have cancer cells in it. So the, the tumor is no longer just localized to the colon. It's already started to sneak its way out into the surrounding lymph nodes. Yeah? So it does make it a more advanced cancer. The higher the stage, the more advanced it is. And unfortunately, the worse the prognosis. So you want to catch it early. And then when we talk about stage four cancer, it's a big tumor. It can be in the lymph nodes already. But more importantly, that's what I mentioned earlier about it spreading to other organs, the bones, the lungs, the liver, for example, right? This is when the cancer started in one area and has moved to somewhere else. Please do not stress about this table. This is just from our national guidelines called the NCCN or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. This is the schema that we use to try and help stage the cancer. So if you look at this top left corner, that is called our T as in Tom, T score. This is, this is related to, the, again, that depth of penetration of the cancer through the layers of the colon. The N stands for node or lymph node. This has to do with the, um, the number of surrounding lymph nodes that are involved. So again, the more lymph nodes involved, the more advanced the cancer is going to be. And then again, this M stands for metastases, like I talked about just in the previous slide, the evidence of cancer having moved beyond the site of origin, beyond the local lymph nodes. Yeah. Once we get a T, an N, and an M score, we put it all together. And as you can see on this table, you add up what T they are, what N they are, what M they are, and then that gives you your ultimate stage, whether you're a stage one, a stage two, a stage three, or a stage four. This, again, is kind of the, from the NCCN, or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. This is basically the workup that we go through when you get diagnosed with colon cancer. So, for example, if you look at this far left where it says colon cancer appropriate for resection, so those are the people that the surgeon feels, yep, yeah, they can handle the surgery, we're going to take them to surgery, it has not spread. They want to make sure that we get a bunch of these blood tests, get a bunch of these CT scans to make sure it has not spread. Then depending on what we find, if it's resectable, non-obstructing, we take you straight for surgery, and so that's colectomy. But let's say it's bulky or it's piercing, then sometimes we consider actually chemotherapy up front to try and shrink the tumor prior to taking you to surgery. So again, it's a very interesting algorithm in how we move forward with from the diagnosis to the staging and then what treatment path we take in a patient, because not every patient is going to get the same treatment for a multitude of reasons. 
treatment. So I just, just mentioned it. So again, if you look here, this is your pathologic stage. So pathologic stage means ideally after they cut it out, right? Then the pathologist can look at it and give us the true size of the tumor, the true uh, invasion of the tumor. They look at the lymph nodes that were removed. Is it really in the lymph nodes? Um, so then depending on your pathologic stage, again, one, two, three, or four, we may or may not do anything. So for example, if you're a T1N0M0, meaning the smallest possible tumor, no lymph nodes involved, and no evidence of spread, we might just observe you, right, after surgery. We kind of just watch and say, this cancer may never come back again, and you may not need any more therapy. However, let's go down to the bottom where you're a more advanced cancer, a T4, remember, a bigger tumor, it's piercing through the colon, you have lymph nodes involved, for example, those people for sure we're going to recommend chemotherapy because the chance of the cancer coming back is higher. The chance of what we call micrometastases, meaning one little cancer cell having gotten out and is sitting somewhere else, but it's too small for our scans to detect, is a real issue. So the hope is that our chemotherapy, what we call adjuvant chemotherapy, which is chemotherapy given after surgery, will try to eliminate those cancer cells that may be hiding in other places to try and decrease that risk of that cancer coming back. And I'll be honest, we're not perfect, right? So there are people who have advanced cancers. You cut it out. You give them chemotherapy. And unfortunately, in some people, the cancer still can come back. But we try to maximize the chance of it not coming back. Approximately 80% of cancers are localized to the colon wall and or regional nodes. And again, surgery is the main and only curative modality for a localized cancer. So that's why ideally you do your colonoscopy, they find the mass, they biopsy it, we send you to a surgeon, you get your scans, et cetera, and then go to surgery because that's your best chance of trying to cure the colon cancer itself. The goal of surgery, of course, is the complete removal of the tumor the blood supply to the tumor and the lymphatic drainage around it because you want to see, did this thing truly get into other local areas, yeah? So adjuvant chemotherapy. So again, the term adjuvant is what we use to describe the chemotherapy that's given after surgery. So you've just recovered from your surgery and you're like, okay, I got through that. And unfortunately, if you're a high enough risk, we still might recommend further therapy. And so chemotherapy are very uh, aggressive chemicals that uh, we have pill versions of some, but traditionally intravenous, for example, and they circulate everywhere, right? And so, again, it's to try and take care of any micro cancers that may have gotten out already. So it's given to those after surgery, and again, the goal for that is to eradicate the micrometastases and, again, decrease the chances of this cancer coming back and increase your cure rate. The benefits of adjuvant chemotherapy have been clearly shown in people who are stage three. So reminder, stage three is those who the, are those people who the cancer has already spread to the lymph nodes in the area. There's a 30% reduction in the risk of disease recurrence and a 20 to 30% reduction in mortality with our current chemotherapy options. The gold standard recipe that we often use is something called Folfox, F-O-L-F-O-X, Folfox, as you can see it on the slide, and you get it. Uh, every other week for 12 total treatments. The uh, F stands for 5-fluorouracil, then there's leucovorin, and then the ox is oxaliplatin. So it's a multi-drug combination recipe to try and kill those micrometastases. Um, but as you guys know, there's definite side effects and toxicities to our chemotherapy. The... Like I alluded to on a previous slide, stage ones, we often just observe, right? Stage threes, we usually offer adjuvant chemotherapy if we think the patient can tolerate it. But what about this nebulous stage two area, right? And unfortunately, the data on stage two is controversial. Chemotherapy, like I said, has side effects. Unfortunately, because it goes into your body and it circulates everywhere, blood circulates, from the tip of your head to the tip of your toe is going to be exposed to this chemotherapy. And it's the normal cell's reaction to the chemotherapy that leads to the side effect. So, for example, mucositis or a significant inflammation of the lining of the mouth or the mucous membrane is because your normal tissues there are being exposed to the chemotherapy and they don't like it. So they become very inflamed and irritated and it can be painful and there can be sores and it can be, it can be tough. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, increased risk of infection, bone marrow suppression, needing blood transfusions, needing growth factor support to help stimulate your um, bone marrow to try and make cells to fight infections, hair loss. I mean, the list of possible side effects of chemotherapy is long, you know? 
Uh, most side effects are reversible. So let's say you get chemotherapy and you unfortunately have significant nausea from it. We stop the chemotherapy and the nausea should get better over time as the effects of the chemotherapy you know, leave your body. So let's say you have a patient with an early stage colon cancer. We take them to surgery, we cut it out. Um, and whether or not we observe them, or if they're a stage three, for example, and we give them the adjuvant chemotherapy, when you're done with all your treatment, like I said, there's still a chance that cancer could come back. So you need to enter what we call surveillance, or the monitoring phase of your treatment. How we watch you to see and hope that this cancer never comes back, but how we try to keep an eye out for it. And again, this is from our National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Stage one, as you can see, so the earliest of the stages, is a colonoscopy at one year after surgery. Depending what they find on the colonoscopy, so if you have an advanced adenoma, which is one of those like angry polyps, then they'll recommend a repeat colonoscopy in a year. If you have a less angry polyp or no advanced adenoma seen, then they might repeat it, they'll repeat it in three years, and if that's negative, then they'll do it every five years. Stage two and stage three are a little bit more complicated, of course, because your risk of the cancer coming back is higher. So we see you every three to six months for years. We check blood tests, we do periodic scans, the colonoscopies. I mean, we really try to keep as close an eye on you as possible to monitor for this cancer recurrence. And hopefully it never comes back, of course. And stage four, we still follow those people, but those are the people who remember the cancer has spread from the site of origin to somewhere else. So unfortunately for stage four, the chance of cure is very low. You know, and many people, unfortunately, we cannot cure at stage four. Um, so those are the people that are, tend to be on chemotherapy longer, trying to control the disease for as long as possible and buy them as much time as possible. So prognosis, so this is what I was just alluding to. If you look at this graph, and there's many different graphs out there, uh, you have survival rate on, one, on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, you have years from diagnosis. And then if you look on the bottom left corner, you have the stages one, two, three, and four. So at the time of diagnosis, of course, at, at year zero, there should be 100% of people alive, right? But then one year, two year, three year, four year, five years out, as you can see, the number of people surviving does decrease. And if you look even at stage one, at one year, there should be about 90% of people still around from the cancer. At year two, about 87%. Year three is about 83%. Year four is about 78%. And year five is about 74%. So as you can see, even with the stage one cancers, that does not mean that the cancer cannot come back. Yeah? It just means less of a chance. Compare that, of course, down to the bottom at, of stage four at the time of diagnosis. So one year, about 40% of people are alive with the cancer. Uh, again, this is people on treatment now, right, to try and slow the cancer down. Year two is about 20%. Year three is about 11%. Year four is about 8%. And a very small number of people, about 5% or less, tend to make it out five years from the time of diagnosis when they're diagnosed with stage four from the beginning. So this underlines the fact that you need to try and catch the cancer early. And that's why screening and colonoscopies are extraordinarily important. I cannot emphasize that point enough. So please, 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 please see your primary, your gastroenterologist, and make sure you stay up to date with your screenings. Again, I want to thank Dr. Masaki and the organizers for the Mini Medical School. This is a great program. I want to thank you guys for taking the time to listen to me today. Uh, and I will be more than happy to take any questions you guys may have. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.